So I'm here once again at Mauna Ohi Ridge in Hahaione Valley on the island of Oahu. And I just wanted to talk about some of the different plants that we have and some of the different management uh, techniques. We have quite an assortment of different species here um, on this site. Some of them, um, you know, are the appropriate native species for um, this site. You know, this, this is kind of a lowland dryland to music site um, here. We're at a couple hundred feet elevation. Um, so, you know, there's a whole assortment of endemic um, and indigenous characters that are appropriate to this area. Um, and then we also have some other native species that are more characteristic of the, you know, coastal strand, um, lowland, dry, you know, habitat. Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting concept because, you know, because the site was so disturbed um, and basically the um, ecological succession has been reset that this site does more closely resemble a, you know, coastal strand, um, you know, a little bit more exposed, a little bit more sun, um, you know, not, not a closed canopy system. So um, that's why we have some species here that are a little bit more uh, you know, appropriate for a coastal setting. Um, and then we have, you know, quite a few species that occupy both of those. So, um, you know, they're found in both the coastal strand and in the more uh, lowland, dryland, and music sites. Um, and then we also are just encouraging any other plants that are thriving in this area to help build biomass, um, you know, help build soil. Um, so, I just wanted to, you know, give a little introduction to some of those things um, and see what's going on around here. Um, there's quite a lot of activity here, a lot of butterfly activity and bees, uh, insects and birds. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of credit that to just allowing basically any and all species that are, that want to, th to survive here, just kind of allowing them to, to survive here, you know? Um, and not excessively weeding and denuding the landscape uh, for no reason, which is, you know, something that I think people tend to do. I, I used to do, kind of do that until I s sort of understood that, you know, it's better to just leave them unless you have a plan to replace it with something, you know, more appropriate, like a native plant. So, you know, if, if I don't have those plants on hand, then there's no reason to, you know, spend a bunch of time and effort pulling out non-native species just for the sake of, you know, trying to eradicate them, which, you know, is kind of a futile effort. You know, they're just going to come back. They're everywhere. Um, so it's better to try to work with them and, you know, see what we can do to start to build more soil and hopefully, you know, favor the native species that are appropriate to this area in the long run. Um, there's this plant here called Uhaloa. This is Uhaloa, uh, definitely one of my favorites. Um, and this was already here, um, growing on this shallow soils of this, you know, kind of bedrocky area over here. You can see there's a lot of Uhaloa. And this is believed to be an indigenous plant. Um, it's also found in like Texas and stuff. So, um, you know, I, I think there was some question as to whether or not it was introduced, like maybe it was an early introduction by the Polynesians. Um, but I think the general consensus is that it's actually a, a native plant. Um, but I've really been encouraging that. And, you know, my understanding is that it's a really good habitat builder. It, it grows well in these highly disturbed sites like this. And, um, you know, it's a native plant and it's got these fuzzy leaves. So it kind of reduces the evapor evapotranspiration and all that. So really drought tolerant. Um, they live for like four or five years um, and then they die. So it's exciting to see there are actually some native plants still on this landscape. Um, and actually I've climbed up this ridge many times and found, you know, various, just a handful of different species of native plants here and there. Uh, stuff like Ilima, Uhaloa. There's one called Ala Ala Vainui, which is a, um, what is that one? A peperomia. 
uh, an indigenous one. I think we have, you know, quite a few endemic species of Peperomia and then like one or two indigenous species. And I find that up there in the rocks and everything. It's kind of like a chasmal flight, chasmal file. Um, it, it likes to just grow out of like rock cracks and everything. And then um, another indigenous plant that I've found up there is A'ali'i, which is Dodonea viscosa uh, in the Sapindaceae family, which is, you know, found, it's pretty widespread actually, um, but it's kind of like a, you know, tough, wind resistant, you know, drought tolerant. And, um, you know, and then interestingly at the very top of this ridge, I found a community of, um, Ule, which is Osteomelis antholifolia, um, an indigenous member of the rose family, um, growing alongside uh, a coco or a coco, which is a euphorbia. It's an endemic euphorbia, um, and so it's really exciting to see. You know, there are there are some native plants um, here and there existing and you know I try to encourage them wherever I can um, and Uhula is a good example so um, this one is Ohai this is a Sesbania this is an uh, it's an endemic um, and it's actually a really threatened um, it's a really endangered species there's this um, vervain here this little purple flower uh, it's edible kind of tastes like mushroom and you know, you kind of see it everywhere. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure to like what degree it's actually causing harm in the ecosystems. But like I was saying earlier in this setting, the native ecosystem is gone. So, <laughs> and literally anything other than the grass is good. Um, and, you know, one thing I've noticed about this, this blue vervain is the butterflies and everybody, all, all, the, all the insects absolutely love it. Um, you know, and it, it has this like nice, rich, dark green foliage, um, you know, creates a lot of shade. It competes, it out competes the grass. Look, here's one of these little butterflies. Um, there were hundreds of these out this morning and there still are actually, they're everywhere. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of pollination going on. Um, these vervains have really taken over, well, I shouldn't say taken over, but they've, they've been really successful on this site um, and filling a lot of these gaps, you know, where I pull out the guinea grass. Um, and then they're really easy to remove or just sort of prune back so that they don't compete with our native plants. So I'll take you down here, um, sort of down to this lower terrace here. And you can see, you know, I built this rock wall, little retention structure and planted native plants on it. And then a lot of the vervain had started to really uh, smother. I don't know about smother, but it was, it was a little bit too out of control. So, you know, I pruned it and then dropped it right on the ground and it's gonna create a little mulch layer. Um, and this is a Elima. This is a different variety. Um, and here's that Ule. This is that um, rose family plant. We got two of these on the site right now. The other one's actually doing a little bit better. Um, so excited to see those. Um, and then here's a plant which I love. It's called Ma'o. We've got a couple of those. Uh, this is a member of the cotton family. Uh, it's in the same genus as cotton. Um, and then we've got this member of the Convolvulaceae family and some very interesting ant activity going on right there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is a, this is in the morning glory family, um, kind of more of a coastal plant, um, but you know, it's a ground cover, sprawling ground cover. So Hopefully we can use that. Um, and then here's a, one of those Ecocos Euphorbia celestroides, I believe. Really interesting endemic plant. Uh, you know, it's got that milky white sap. 
Uh, it's oh, it's actually flowering. I didn't notice that before. It's got a little, you know, euphorbia flower. Um, there's actually quite a few of those. A lot of different endemic euphorbias. Really, really cool. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, so there's that other ule up there. Doing pretty good. Um, um, you know, we've got uh, random papayas here and there that kind of make their way, you know, in the compost. And, oh, and here's a one I should talk about. Wait, oh, almost ate shit. All right. So, the Hawaii state flower is the Mauhahele. Uh, it's a yellow hibiscus. It's an endemic species and uh, you know, it's an absolutely stunning plant. Got to be one of my favorites. The state flower is the Mauhauhele. Um, and those can grow pretty large, you know, into this big shrub or, you know, some, some of them have a more tree form. Uh, and we've got a couple of them here. They're really easy to propagate from cuttings and, and seeds. So I'm hoping to really propagate a lot of those and um, let's see what else we got here got this coconut tree uh, you know coconuts are not they're they're not really native to Hawaii I think like I mean they are but it's like they're they're you know they were thought to be a Polynesian introduction for the longest time until like there was like pollen found in some site somewhere so there's there's like one site with like one piece of evidence that suggests that coconuts were here before Polynesians got here. Um, you know, and, but then the Polynesians came and brought tons of coconuts, so, I don't know. It's just kind of fun to have some coconut trees, you know, they provide shade, um, you know, create a lot of good mulch, and like I was saying earlier, anything is better than grass, so. <laughs> coconut tree for now might cut it down later um, same thing goes with this cook pine uh, non-native um, potentially invasive spreading um, you know usually that happens more up there in the in the wetter you know uplands but uh, probably gonna cut this thing down sooner rather than later because it's growing really quickly um, <laughs> uh, let's see what else we got we got these oyster plants just kind of a fun little ground cover. These are non-native. Oh, and here's a plant I should talk about. Here's Nio, the false sandalwood. Uh, this is a really, really cool native plant. Um, sometimes it's a tree, sometimes it's a shrub, sometimes it's a low sprawling ground cover. All the same species, just super highly variable. Um, you know, and across the state, it's been affected by this thrips pest uh, which kind of causes this like wrinkly leaf thing um, so that's kind of unfortunate um, but it doesn't well it does actually kill the tree sometimes but not not necessarily um, but yeah these these flowers smell so good they're like the sweetest honey you've ever smelled um, and it's just it's so strong too like you can smell it from pretty far away and, you know, you can imagine when there was like a lot of these on the landscape and they're all flowering at the same time. I think there are some descriptions that, you know, sailors could smell this like 100 miles offshore. <laughs> like, it smells so good. And, you know, this plant is doing pretty good. There's, I got three of them on the site and, you know, they're pretty easy to propagate from, from seed and from cuttings. Um, but, you know, in its native or in its original habitat this thing was found from the coast all the way up to like seven eight thousand feet you know I've, I've explored the sides of Mauna Kea and there's whole forests where the this plant is the dominant tree it's the dominant canopy um, but I believe this is more of like the shrub ground cover form um, so you know maybe eventually it kind of grows into a tree but we'll see uh, let's see what else we got. We got this really spiky, non-native member of the legume family. Some kind of like mesquite or something. I can't remember. Uh, 
but it's cool for now. It's not doing any any harm. And in fact, it's probably helping the situation. Um, can't forget about the hollow tree. Really cool native plant. A little bit spiky, serrated leaves there. Just gotta be a little bit careful, but this thing can grow into like, you know, a massive tree. Um, there's that Plumbago iliae. It's an absolutely amazing plant. It's This one is doing so well. It's got several inflorescences going, sprawling out in multiple directions and starting to really take over the ground. So, oh yeah, and there's a willy willy back there. It's doing pretty good, but it's kind of, it's something's af affecting it. It's afflicted by, there's like these little black spots and the leaves are kind of, they got this like pale yellow thing, but you know, that's another drought deciduous one. So it'll just like drop its leaves and re-sprout new ones. Um, and you know, I can tell that that one is doing okay. Uh, let's see, we got this native morning glory. Koaliava on the fence. And then we've got like, you know, I broadcast all these Ilima seeds, um, which is that native member of the Malvaceae family. Um, and they're sprouting up all throughout here in this kind of protected understory. Uh, so that's kind of interesting, you know, on the other side of the fence, we've got some action. Oh, the other one I wanna just kind of quickly mention is this, this is indigo. And they're starting to pop up everywhere. This is a really successful non-native uh, invasive legume. And this is indigo. This is how you make uh, blue jeans. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a legume. Really fast growing. Uh, really successful plant. Um, really good for chopping and dropping. You can already see that this one I've done several times. It's got quite a trunk forming. Um, it's essentially coppiced down low. And here's some of the material that I cut earlier, uh, already starting to dry out. And, uh, you know, there's like thousands of seeds in there. They're just gonna be, oh, they already are. They're, they're popping up everywhere. Um, but I'm totally cool with that. You know, fast growing pioneer support species. Here they are. They're gonna provide shade, provide more organic material. Um, you know, let's see what else we got. A couple other notables. We got this guy. Um, can't remember what the species is on that one, but it is a highly effective ground cover. Um, you can see it kind of taking over this whole bottom section here along the fence. Uh, when the seed pods mature, they explosively dehiss, and you can kind of hear it sometimes. They just go. And the you know seeds go flying everywhere, um, but it creates this like really dense ground cover down here. The bees love it, you know, pollinators love it, um, you know. And then down down here under this lemon tree, um, it has completely taken over and created this really nice, dense, shady, moist understory. And I've even found like big mushrooms down in there, so I'm cool with that one. Um, pretty easy to like manage. I mean, if you're going, if you're doing these, using these techniques of, you know, chop and drop, then it's actually pretty easy to deal with. Um, here it is over here, taking over. And then we also have this uh, non-native morning glory taking over the fence line, which is fine with me for now. Uh, it'd be cool if I could get the native one to grow there, but actually the native one's kind of like way bigger and, uh, this one is like a miniature version of it. So let's see what other ones we got. Um, oh yeah, we got this weird ornamental that I just stuck in there. Those can get massive and hard to deal with. Um, so I'm a little bit hesitant about those, but I've been chopping them and dropping them. So for now, those are those are fine. Let's see, what do we got? We got this uh, Talanzia. Related to pineapples, if you can believe that. Um, we got Nalpaka Kahakai, which 
definitely, you know, we're a little bit up in the in the uplands, you know, kind of outside of that the native range of Naupaka Kahakai. Uh, that's Skevola. Uh, can't remember, but it's an indigenous plant, uh, pan tropical uh, distribution. You know, it it can make its way across the ocean and grows along beaches and stuff. And you know, we got this Pohina Hina. Uh, Vitex rotundifolia, more of a coastal plant too. So, and then here is a coquio, coquio, super endangered member of the Malvaceae family, hibiscus relative, uh, cotton relative, um, makes these really crazy looking flowers. Um, yeah, I'd be stoked if we can get this thing to survive here. There's another willy willy tree. And here's a ma'ohahele. Hibiscus. And another willy willy behind it. Uh, another nalpaka over there. So. And then here's kind of our big ma'o. Big Hawaiian cotton. Here's the flower. Here's the seed pods covered in cotton. And, you know, same genus as cotton. So I also just really like the leaves. They're just like this awesome silver fuzzy color. And it's just a nice plant. This is a really interesting concept. Like all of this put together in, you know, this dynamic novel ecosystem. How can we what can we do to, you know, increase the diversity and the sort of functional ability, you know, of this land, you know, to like, its capacity to hold life, essentially. Um, and thankfully, I think I'm on the right track, which is to encourage the development of soils. Um, you know, you can see a little bit of soil forming on top of this old dirt that we got here um, so we'll definitely keep updating as much as possible uh, maybe i'll be able to make it out here in the summer sometime to get some good documentation of of this site during the dry summer uh, because it, it looks totally different um, you know a lot of these plants are drought deciduous they drop their leaves they go totally dormant um, and they just wait it out. <laughs> they just wait. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of really interesting things here. Um, hopefully I was coherent. Uh, but yeah, let me know if you have any questions or thoughts on this whole concept. Uh, and check in again later. Hopefully I'll have more stuff, more videos. All right, aloha.